Faith here with your welcome toast. It was Arthur Rubenstein who said, What good are vitamins? Eat four lobsters, eat a pound of caviar, live. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. Ooh. It's great to have you joining the party on the Faith Middleton Food Schmooze inviting you to eat, drink, and be merry with us. Wait until you hear the conversations that we have lined up for you. Very, very special. We've got the author of this intriguing book. It's called The Bad Food Bible. These are the things that you might think are bad that maybe you can eat so you don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> we hear that. <laughs> also, we have a new star home cook to feature on the show. Somebody made a cake that is knockout, but I'm going to leave that to you folks when you eat it and just see what you think. I know what I think. And we're with our special guest for the show, Sarah Newland, who lives in yeah, Hamden, Connecticut, and is head of the Newland Foundation. We're having her on the show because she knows a thing or two about where to eat in New York City. We're obviously close enough. We're always uh-huh. wondering about this. Sarah says, go there. I'm going there. And she has got a place ready for us. We're going to give you the hot tip on that. We are at the Big G in downtown New Haven, Gateway Community College. I love this place. We love all community colleges. In fact, we're big fans of them. My food buddies are here, and that's Chris Prosperi, Alex Province. We told you about Sarah and the senior producer, the amazing Robin Doyen Aiken. Hey, everybody. Hey. 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 Sarah, special yes. welcome to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on the show. My I know pleasure. you love food, so you're, oh, in the, please. you're in the right <clears throat> place for us. That's right. Sarah and I in the past have gone to a couple places where we have had, we've been forced to sample, it was been summer, <laughs> sample the rosés, you true. know, just oh, to see. And just to be polite, just to you be polite. To. Just oh, so, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Being kind. <laughs> it was for work. <laughs> I'm polite, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Here's the thing. We have, on occasion on this show, featured a home cook. If we select this person, we yes. call this person the star home cook. It can be the simplest thing or it can be a little more complicated. We think we have settled on a recipe when we name somebody the star home cook. So that's what this is about. I was at an event and I tasted the lemon drizzle cake made by a Sally Searby. Uh, she is originally from England, lives in Greenport, Connecticut, and I almost fell over <laughs> eating this cake. So I convinced her that she should make one for us and bring it on the show. So, Sarah, you have your piece. Yes. It's Chris and Robin, I know you've had yours. Oh, Alex, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> Sarah, you just dive in. I have mine in my hand okay. right here. Me too. So this is a... Oh, oh my yeah. God. That's what I said. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah, right? That's what I said. It explodes. It explodes, yeah. it explodes yeah. in your mouth. The it's lemon. just mm. amazing. It's yeah. got like a layer of lemon curd yes. plus Boys. sugary lemon drizzle on the yeah. top with that acidy thing and that sweet thing. Sweet and acid. Your cheeks yeah. are puckering up. Well, a well the more. thing is, there's something that goes on on the side of your That's tongue, bad. and I don't yeah. know what it is. Is it the butter mm-hmm. or something? But it yeah. is. I say that all the time. I just. Yep. Mm. Okay. So yeah. we said, can we have the recipe? And she said, of course. Very generous. Awesome. I said, you know, what can I do? Can I yeah. give you here's <laughs> your first $50? Yeah. Would you please open a bakery? <laughs> it's self-rising flour, baking powder. These are normal things. Sugar, yeah. eggs, butter, yeah. lemon, lemon zest. Yes. And then she makes a lemon curd, which is oh. a juicy lemon with grated zest, only the juice, yeah. more sugar, eggs, more butter than the ice which is lemon zest and sugar again and lemon juice. You see, boom, 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 lemon, lemon. It's triple lemon cake. That's my little code Mm. word for it. It's triple lemon. There is lemon in every element of the cake. Do you like it, Robin? I love it. And different lemon. In my mouth, it had different aspects of lemon. It does. Your whole tongue plays in this. You go ahead. I'm just I'm just just, Yeah. <laughs> it's a mouthful of yeah. sunshine. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's it. Right that's there. It. It's a mouthful of sunshine. It really is. That's brilliant. Delicious. And the glaze you on need the to top. Go, people, you need to go to our website and oh. see this recipe and make this. I am not a baker, but I will try to make this that's, cake. It's not doesn't hard. sound difficult. 
But she has a thing. She and her mother used to have cake and tea because in uh, England everything is solved yeah, yeah, with by cake, cake and tea. tea. I used to say everything was cured by dancing, but I'm changing my mind. But the thing about, the thing about this is there are lots of, clearly lots of steps, but it's not a difficult cake. That's right. I mean, it's you don't have to. It's this, not super high. Like super high. It, it's spring. Yeah. It tastes like spring. Yes. It does. Okay, yeah. that's good, Sarah. To see our star home cook, Sally Searby of Greenport, New York, go to foodschmooze.org to see what she calls her lemon drizzle cake and what Robin calls her triple lemon cake. Okay, <laughs> so it's right there at foodschmooze.org. You'll see the whole recipe and how to make it. Trust me on this one. This is good. This could make you a devotee of lemon. Mm-hmm. Yep. I know. You could even make it. Sally has a lemon glaze that goes over the top. And it's that, crackly. Yeah, yeah, that's what she calls her drizzle. I was thinking, too, what a great kind of poke cake this would make. If you took toothpicks oh, yeah. and Poked made some holes on the top of this cake and then put the drizzle on, mm. some of that drizzle is going to seep in and go right through to the lemon curd. And then genius. it's just like double the mm. sweetness and awesomeness of Ooh, this. Yeah, yeah. Genius. Could, could you okay. make this as a cupcake? Oh, oh why couldn't you? you? Why wouldn't why wouldn't oh, you be able to? Yeah. I want this as okay. a cupcake. Okay. How about as a toothpaste? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I have another wild announcement. This is kind of crazy, but so last week in the mail came a letter and a plaque. And when I opened it, I was really stunned. And here's why. Because remember last year I was promoting the Basque mm-hmm. Festival from the Spanish region oh, of yeah. Spain, London, although right? I'm the not sure they paella. feel Spanish. But yeah, the yes, giant, giant paellas paella. and yes, cauldrons yes. down the harbor Dancing in London and, and all that. Ro- Rioja. And... Well, because I've been a big Spanish food and wine fan for decades. So I couldn't wait to tell people that this was going to be the first time this was ever held in New London. These Basque people coming not only from Spain, but all over New England especially. And here we go yeah. with the New England Basque Society. So I look at the letter and the plaque, and I keep reading it because I think, is this real or is somebody joking with me? It says, you have been appointed the very first ambassador to the independent Basque region of Spain, which is on the <laughs> French border, and that I was invited now as a guest of the Spanish government to tour Basque country with them oh, because wow. they want to introduce me to you, you know what I think ambassador. is my secret homeland. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're now Basque nobility. Yes, Madam Ambassador. Wow. Madam Ambassador. Wow. Thank you. Thank I don't you. mind being your bad girl if you need somebody to hold the luggage and stuff. I'm volunteering for that. I'm the That's assistant good. ambassador. <laughs> okay, you're on. Okay. Um, and here's the thing that I just learned. I didn't know this, but it was such a huge event last year that they're doing it again. They're nice. all coming from Spain. And they're coming with all the products, the yeah. giant cauldrons. They're making the special homemade paellas, their dance, music. It's right on the harbor. Yes. And they're going to do it again Saturday, August 17th on the New London waterfront. It's from noon to 4. And you can find tickets online at Downtown New London Association. Of course, the ambassador will be there. Yeah. I just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's right at the train station on the harbor, and it's right next door to Cross Sound Ferry. So if you're coming from our region in Long Island or coming from any part of Connecticut or New York, you can certainly Mm -hmm. get there. Okay. Again, that is Saturday, August 17th, online at Downtown New London Association, the Basque Festival on the harbor front in New London, Connecticut. (laughs) You know, before we get to this amazing book, which is the Bad Food Bible, it's unbelievable. Why do you hear this? Spring foods, we should mention something because it's all coming out now. And yeah. we've, it's all been wintry for so long. We did asparagus the yep, time. Before. Cherries. Awesome. Let's do cherries. <gasps> Who doesn't love cherries? I eat them all the time. I learned this from my good friend Lou. He showed me this way of eating them that changed cherries for me forever. <laughs> It's a simple way to do it, but I'm telling you, you have to try it to believe it. Are you ready? You take your cherries, and I wash them when you first get them, right? Then I put them in a nice big stainless steel bowl. To the bowl, I add a whole tray of ice cubes, and then I fill the bowl with water. 
they're floating in there and then I just move them around a little bit and I let them sit in the ice water for, I don't know, just a couple minutes. And then you eat them out of the ice water and it totally changed my cherry eating experience. What happens? They, they get – when they get cold, they almost explode with flavor in your mouth because as soon as you put them in your mouth, your mouth is warm, Right. It is the best Ooh. way to eat a cherry wow, on this is earth. something. <laughs> we have to start. No, we have to start because you know my yeah. thing with frozen potato chips. Yeah, that's it. We've frozen got, potato chips. Oh, she doesn't know. Frozen potato yeah. chips. I've been doing this ever since Faith told me. That's Are not exactly a spring food. <laughs> no, but it, the most but it delicious thing. They oh, are crunchier. Them. A scientist told me yeah. why. I can't remember. Yep. They are so phenomenal. They don't taste frozen. Nope. But they are wildly crisp and crackly yeah. and, and explosive and phenomenal. Yeah, well, they work with Pringles. And they'll oh, last yes, in there for six Pringles. months. So, yes, yeah, so try that. I want everyone to next time they get cherries, just take a few cherries, put them in a bowl with a couple ice cubes. Are you saying the flavor there. is better? It, they explode in your mouth. It is life. There are certain yeah, all things of us are gonna that are life-changing. Are you going to say that life-changing thing? life-changing. <laughs> I'm ta- cherry try it. Else is it gonna and i got to give credit to my friend Lou because I'm like you. I sat there and watched him eat eat this on his What's sofa. I thought he was nuts. Uh, as soon as I tried it, it was like the potato chip. That was life changing. Oh, oh boy. Good okay. Lord. Yeah. This may be the easiest recipe you've ever shared with us, Chris. Yep. Just cherries All, on ice. Cherries on, but not just on ice. Ice water, right? Ice they got to be oh, floating yeah. no, in no. cherry yeah. ice cream. No, I hear yeah. the subtle yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Subtle. It's not just on ice. <laughs> yeah. They got to be chilled from the right outside. Well, they're know, surrounded. Know. It's yeah. surrounded yeah. In, yeah. In, in cold yeah. liquid. Do you have to stand on one foot, Chris? We no, no. You can hand? sit or stand. I mean, you can try that, Alex. We take but this just, very seriously. But, but you should sit down because when you bite into this cherry, you're going to need to It'll sit fall down. over. Yep. Okay. All right. It'll be like eating a cherry again for the first time in your life. Wow. Mm. I know. It's, I'm building it up, but it's, it is pretty <laughs> special. Go ahead and try it. Let me know. More mouthwatering conversation and fun ahead on the Faith Middleton Food Schmooze, and I hope you will make a charitable contribution to Feed the Hungry. We're online now at foodschmooze.org, and we'll be right back. Oh, life is just a bowl of cherries, so live while you're living, and let baby laugh at it all. I'm Faith Middleton. You can sign up for our free podcast, which is a copy of the show. It arrives in your inbox every single week, and you can listen to it on your schedule. That's how podcasts work. I'm with my treasured food buddies, Chris Prosperi, chef and co-owner of Metro Beast Restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut, wine broker Alex Province, and our special guest, Sarah Newland of the Newland Foundation, who knows where to eat in New York City. And so I, I cannot wait to talk with her. So here's the question, because I'm excited about this interview. Do you live with any anxiety about your food choices? Do you sort of love junk food and you've been shamed for it? Chris is raising his hand. <laughs> like, do you, or you maybe you're somebody who preaches the gospel of healthy choices. So no matter where you are on this, if you're not anxious about what you're choosing, you're the exception. We read the news, we talk to friends, and if we can afford to, we worry about, let's see, Mercury in fish, hormones in meat, whether sugar will cause autism, whether our cooking vessels cause cancer or Alzheimer's, that food not grown locally is increasing global warming. We even worry now about cooking food at all because it supposedly ruins the nutrients. (laughs) That's just for starters. This book just might ease your anxiety. Dr. Carroll, Dr. Aaron Carroll, looks at the best science from his perspective and offers answers to important questions. Is diet soda really bad for you or the kids? Is organic more healthful, I mean truly healthful, and worth the money? What about eggs? 
Science goes back and forth. What about coffee? What about alcohol? Butter? Meat versus fish? GMOs? MSG? To get at the answers, which studies should we believe and why? That's the question, isn't it? Because there's a study coming out all the time. Yes, but six months later, another academic study is going to come out that completely reverses yeah. the first study. This so, is what Dr. Carroll says in this book too, Sarah. And I've, I've read this book twice. That's how interesting <laughs> it is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here's the beauty part about what our guest, Dr. Carroll, has done. Like his colleagues, including best-selling author Nina Teicholz, who does the introduction for the Bad Food Bible, as this is called, Dr. Carroll decided to study the studies. Now, what do I mean by that? He studies studies about food to figure out what to recommend, not not only to his patients, but what to teach his medical school students. He understands what most of us don't. What makes a study the gold standard of studies? And how often so many media outlets, we jump on sexy sounding studies because it's interesting, they're interesting, provocative, it makes news. The problem is that it wasn't necessarily a very good study. Yet we hear about that study over and over and we start making choices. Why wouldn't we? But think about this. We became fatter during the high-carb, low-fat era. How did that happen? We were convinced by experts that it was the smart way to eat. And, of course, I could go on. The way this works together at the intersections of research, media, government, the corporate world, all of this creates a misleading system. Unless you know where and how to look for what's real. We're not researchers on the show, of course. There's no question our diabetes, heart disease, and obesity numbers are bad. So what choices are we really supposed to make? That's what we're going to do with Dr. Aaron Carroll. He is professor of pediatrics and the director of the Center for Health Policy and Professionalism Research at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's had three previous books, and this one, The Bad Food Bible, how and why to eat sinfully. <laughs> you think, oh, really, that. kind of do- medical doctors <laughs> saying this? Let me just say, it's really fascinating. Welcome to the Fooch Moose. Thank you for having me. You must be on Social Security by now. That went on so long. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet, no. It's always nice when people want to talk about it. Great. <laughs> so what happened to you that made you want to write this book that looks at the gold standard of studies? The book originated out of a number of columns that I was writing. Um, For the Times? At the New York Times, exactly, is that I sort of cover health research, health policy, and how we can bring data and evidence to make better decisions about, you know, what we do about health in general. And over time, I started to notice that when I wrote about food, those were the columns that were the most popular, and they were the ones that were actually the most helpful to even what I was doing with my own life. Did you get the most pushback from those two? Sometimes it depends what you're talking about. So I think the first one I wrote was about coffee, and uh, the, the gist of it was that my editors and I were talking about the fact that, like you were saying in your introduction, you know, you read a bad study, then you read a good study. Your coffee's terrible for you, and then and we just don't know the answer. And so I said, well, look, let me go back, and I will review the literature, and I will see what I could find. Shockingly, there has been an enormous amount of research on coffee, more than almost any other drug that you could take. And the vast, vast majority of it was really in the positive direction, that if you took an honest, holistic look at the evidence that we have for coffee, it is unequivocally leaning towards positive. But what we need to take home is it's definitely not negative. And we're told all the time, you need to worry about coffee. You're going to get addicted to coffee. It's a vice. It's so bad for you. There's no (laughs) evidence for that at all. Uh And... When we published that, I mean, people people loved that one. Um, but of course, when I wrote about artificial sweeteners, which is another thing you brought up, that inspired more hatred than almost anything else I've ever. Artificial written. sweeteners. Hate diet soda. I did not realize yeah. this. Um, there were organizations that were, you know, calling for my license to be taken away. Somebody even questioned whether or not I should have my children taken away from me um, because wow. I let them drink diet soda every once in a while. So people hold really passionate views about Wait a minute now. So tell me about diet soda. What's the bottom line on that? Here's the thing. Of course, you could live a life where you have none of this stuff. You could drink only water for the rest of your life. But (laughs) given that people are going to drink other things, I think the real question that we are concerned about is what's better or worse, a sugar drink or a a diet drink? 
And there's an unequivocal evidence that sugar drinks are bad for us. They're bad for your teeth. They're bad for your health. Added sugars are one of those few things where there's almost no positive literature whatsoever. But when it comes to artificial sweeteners, the studies, again, the good studies are unequivocally pointing to the fact that it's almost impossible for us to pick up a danger. Even the original studies that were done on saccharin and rats back in the 60s and 70s, I mean, if you look at those studies, they would do study after study after study and find nothing. Finally, they did one study where they fed rats an enormous amount of saccharin, like, you know, horse-level doses. And then they fed the children of those rats enormous amounts of saccharin. And some of those rats had an increased risk of bladder cancer. And this is like one out of 30 to 60 studies. And based on that, all the warnings went up. Well, of course, humans don't really get bladder cancer that much. It's rats get bladder cancer. It turns out if you give them a lot of vitamin C, they'll get bladder cancer. And so when they did further careful studies, the dangers were never picked up in humans. The warnings are all gone. And now it's wow. moved on to the new panic du jour, whether it be aspartame or another one. But we have huge randomized control trials. And if we have nothing else, human beings drink tons of this stuff. If they were truly harmful and the idea that you're going to get massive amounts of brain cancer, which is often what people worry about with aspartame, we'd be picking it up. We aren't. And it's not showing up in the ways that you would think. And oh, so, again, I'm forced to question, if you had to choose, I'd take diet soda any day of the week. So I'm going to ask you that one subtle thing that many people talk about, I've even talked about it myself, where they say, oh, but if you're someone who's not allowed to have sugar, say, pre-diabetes or diabetes, it's still not good to have diet soda because it's fooling your body. And your body then says, I'm into sugar. So you're going to have a harder time staying away from sugar. Is there any truth to that? So I'm going to push back on that because I want us to really think through the science on that one. Mm. So your body reacts to glucose. I mean, that's what it's getting down to. It's the actual, you know, fruit goes broken into glucose and the pancreas, which releases insulin, doesn't know that it's sweet. It just knows that there's glucose around. Artificial sweeteners are an entirely different molecule. If we could fool our brains <laughs> Isn't this the into best? thinking that we'd had sugar and that we should re- release insulin, then the opposite should be true. If we take really bad food for us but make it taste like vegetables or something terrible, we would never gain weight because our body would be fooled into thinking that we were consuming you know, healthy food. That's not how it works. It all gets broken down into molecules which are recognized that have nothing to do with taste. And so a lot of those studies which show that people Mm -hmm. who who drink diet soda are more likely to be overweight and then the people say, oh, it must be tricking our body. Those are almost entirely associations. And what we're seeing is that two things. One, people who are overweight tend to drink more diet soda. That's the causal pathway. It's not that the diet soda leads to overweight. It's that often overweight leads to us trying to make diet choices in those beverages. So it's not one causing the other. Uh It's the opposite. And we just see the study with an association and we start making links that just aren't there. Can I just say, this is going to be the most replayed podcast in (laughs) all of the Coachman's history. Okay. um, Let me just say, this is Dr. Aaron Carroll. He teaches medical students, uh, writes for the New York Times, does a column professor of pediatrics. He's at the University School of Medicine, and he's in Indiana. And I wanted to say, he does the upshot column. I've read him many times, and that's how I got to this book, The Bad Food Bible. It's at foodschmooze.org if you want more information, how and why to eat sinfully. He's looking at the gold standard of studies as opposed to all the little nickel and dime studies that people get paid to do and that we see in the media and that we then believe (laughs) Meat. Let's talk about meat. Look, maybe somebody feels better not having meat or feels noble or something, or there's a reason you can't have meat. Maybe you have oxalates or whatever you have. What's the bottom line on meat? Let me, you know, reiterate what you just said to start off, where if people don't want to eat meat for ethical reasons or for Mm -hmm. climate science, fine. I have no issue with that whatsoever. If you don't like meat, I'm not trying to convince people to eat meat. It's just My mission is to remove a lot of the fear that people have. And there are many, many columns that you can read. In fact, my original meat column was spurred because uh, I think it was Dean Ornish wrote an op-ed in the New York Times arguing that eating meat significantly increases your chance of dying. Let's start with that specific study that he was citing. 
pretty that serious. That was a study that looked in. Yeah, that that study looked at basically a whole bunch of people and said how many servings with an S of like meat or red meat are you eating a day? Yeah, um, and then said the people that were eating at the high end had a higher risk of death at the low end. But that was only if you looked at the people who were younger than sixty five. Because if you looked at the people over 65, the opposite was true. In fact, the whole study was negative. If you globally looked at everybody in the study, no association. But if you start cherry-picking, below 65, slightly higher risk of death. But above 65, slightly lower risk of death. Of course, he wasn't yes. arguing that old people okay. should eat more meat. But nobody does that. They only cherry-pick the data that supports their argument. Uh-huh. Plus, yeah. if you're eating servings with an S of red meat a day, okay, you know, cut back a little bit. That's fine. But most of us are worried that, you know, if you have the occasional burger or steak that you're going to keel over dead. There's no science or truth behind that at all. Even the WHO, which truly can never find something that doesn't cause cancer. And I say that almost literally. <laughs> thousand substances that they've studied, one, they've said this does not cause cancer. Everything else causes cancer or might cause cancer or it's a possible risk of cancer. Well, but with meat, it wasn't even red meat. It was processed red meat. And the number that everybody knows is it, is it increases your risk of colon cancer by 18%. That's a lifetime risk. When we say 18%, which sounds scary, it has to be translated into an absolute risk, and you can find an absolute risk. So if I go to the NIH's website and I plug in all my risk factors for colon cancer, and you have to be 50, so let's, let's pretend I'm 50, it turns out that my lifetime risk of colon cancer with my diet and everything else I eat, let, let's just say for the sake of argument it's like 2.5%. If I committed today, and I believe the WHO's report, if I committed today to eating an extra serving, three pieces of bacon every day for the rest of my life, and I'm not going to do that, but even if I said every day forever, another three pieces of bacon, my overall lifetime risk of colon cancer might go from like 2.5% to like 2.8%. How would your kidneys be? Well, Probably fine, because again, our body, we've two of them, and they're not overworked, and it would be totally fine absorbing that, that little bit of extra sodium. But the, the point of the matter is that that's an incredibly low overall change for what many would perceive to be an enormous benefit. If I take a 1,000 people and I give them all three pieces of extra bacon a day, maybe like one or two of them might get colon cancer over a lifetime. That's a very low-risk thing, and yet you read the news, you see the 18%, and you get all these people panicking every day, and they're worried about eating the occasional serving of red meat, not an extra serving every day for the rest of their lives. So a lot of this is just overblown. Who wants to propose right now to Dr. Aaron Carroll? Does anybody want to propose (laughs) to him? I I do. I'd like to be first in line. Um, The Bad Food Bible, he's the author of this. It's amazing. How and why eat sinfully. He's a medical school doc, uh, writes the New York Times, one of the upshot columns on a regular basis. Okay, here we are, alcohol. Uh, (laughs) Here we go. I thought, oh, this is going to be one area where you do kind of have to watch out, right? Well, okay, let's, again, let's... let's (laughs) Acknowledge the elephant in the room. Start. Alcoholism is terrible. Alcohol abuse is terrible. People who drink too much alcohol are absolutely impacting their um, their health in a negative way. But the people who are truly drinking too much comprise even at a rough estimate, let's say less than 10% of the population. You know, mm-hmm. Again, most of us are worried that the occasional drink is going to sink us in some way. And if you read the news, you'd agree. Because, I mean, even I think within the last year or two, there have been studies saying there is no safe level of alcohol, even one drink mm-hmm. a day. Especially for women. Way. Yes. So you have to cherry pick the evidence because the dangers that show up from alcohol other than, of course, alcoholism again, are most often cancer. But if you look globally at the risk of cancer, for many, many cancers, the absolute risk changes are very, very small. And you have to get up to the danger zones, which is more than, you know, one drink a day, which is more than, on average, seven drinks a week for a woman, 14 drinks for a man, to get above that. Most of these risks are relative risks. And again, what's really odd is, is when you look at heart disease and the literature, there isn't this negative connotation. If anything, there's a positive association for reducing heart disease. And given that heart disease is the number one killer of men and women uh, in the United States right now, globally, these risks with alcohol just aren't there. Again, I have to caution for, you know, social drinking, safe drinking, not alcoholism, not alcohol abuse. But binge drinking. the studies, yes, yeah, the binge drinking is terrible, but the studies that find 
the damage are often in huge amounts, which this recent one did. They're often, you know, studies that are associations, not necessarily causal. And there have been some randomized controlled trials, which, of course, are the best studies that look at alcohol and some risk factors. And again, they lean towards a positive association. Like coffee, I think the take-home message shouldn't be go out and drink, it's good for your health. The take-home message should be we don't really see these dangers that everybody's mm. worried about at safe levels. If you get joy out of the occasion, cocktail, that's great because joy is a benefit. Yay. Love him. Bring <laughs> on the wine. What about alcohol with saccharin? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I don't think the study's been done, but it'd yeah. probably be fine. Yeah. Jack and Diet Coke. I can say that our bodies can handle a little bit of everything, right? Sure. I mean, we're yeah. tougher than we say we are. I have no interest in a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, I am. Aren't there, yeah. honestly, aren't there times in your life where you're going to have two pieces of cake, three brownies, <laughs> three cocktails. Okay. It's just going to happen on certain occasions. So Saturdays. Well, I wrote a column on one Thanksgiving where I was like, I'm amazed every year when we see those articles about how many calories in the Thanksgiving meal. And I'm always like, who cares? That's one day yeah. a year. It's like, worry about the other 364. It's the other, you know, steady life choices that you make, yeah. not the occasional I'm going to let it go. Um, what about pregnant women, Dr. Carolyn, alcohol? First of all, the evidence is not nearly as solid as we would like. That's part of the problem. It does appear that there is an association between alcohol consumption at, at high levels or at levels that we just don't know what the number is on at certain points in pregnancy that are associated with bad outcomes. And because of that, you know, many people rationally say, since we don't know the level and we don't know the date, we're better off just saying it's better for women not to drink during pregnancy. And that is totally rational. The problem is that we've now taken that to be that, like, like, okay, well, then if you just touch alcohol at any point during pregnancy, you're significantly increasing the rate. That's not known. And there are certainly parts of the world where women have the occasional cocktail or glass of wine and don't see increases in their, their problems. There have been studies where actually if you talk to obstetricians and ask them, what do you tell your patients? The vast majority of them say, absolutely, I tell them never to drink alcohol. And you say, well, how confident are you in the evidence that this is true? And they're like, oh, I'm not confident at all. Because mm -hmm. they know this is a nuanced, problematic thing, but we just don't do nuance in health very well. Mm. Very you know, I was rational. just thinking about a study I just read, and these are attorneys who are representing women who are pregnant and being arrested in different parts of the United States for doing something like tripping, they're pregnant, and the women end up getting arrested for endangering the fetus. I'm, I'm literally amazed you brought this up because it might have been yesterday. A study was published uh, in, in PLOS One which basically looked at how alcohol policies specifically relating to drinking during pregnancy have affected or being associated with health outcomes in babies because a lot of these policies are doing exactly what you're saying. They're almost criminalizing drinking while you're pregnant. And what that turns out to have done is had the opposite effect that we'd like. It's actually associated with increased preterm birth and more low birth weight babies, probably because women get panicked that they're going to get in trouble and don't go to the doctor and don't get prenatal care because they're driven underground by these kinds of laws and policies. And Jeez. so if we make people fear and we do it without good evidence, we often wind up with policies that cause more harm than good. Here's the thing I've wrestled with uh, pretty much all my adult life, and that's organic versus not organic. Doctors and people will say to you, you've got to eat more vegetables, much better to eat more vegetables. And I think, but there's all this poison on them. How can that be good for me? What does this all mean? And so I read with the greatest interest your chapter on organic. Can you give us a bottom line on that? Yeah, I, this chapter came out in an argument that I had with my wife. It was Thanksgiving, and I had bought all the stuff that she asked me to in the list. And when she saw that the gravy that I bought for the turkey was not organic gravy, she got very angry. And I was like, you can't possibly think that gravy is healthy if it's organic. It's gravy. Like, that's not, there's no way it makes a difference. It's not a thing. If you like organic food because you think that it tastes better, I'm great with that. I mean, you know, homegrown vegetables are often amazing and the local produced food can be amazingly tasty, so that's great. But if you're under the illusion that it's healthier, that it leads to better health outcomes, yeah. or that it's somehow safer and the idea that it has less harmful stuff in it, there's no evidence for that at all. There have been 
systematic reviews, which again are studies of studies that have been put out, gathering all of the evidence, I mean hundreds of studies that look at organic food and its relationship to both safety, to nutrients, whether or not it contains more minerals or vegetables, whether it contains better amounts of protein or not, and whether or not it contains more pesticides. And the evidence is overwhelmingly in that it just doesn't make a difference. What does organic mean anyway? I mean, exactly. the definition of organic is really fluid. Most organic food these days is produced by what everyone else would consider to be industrialization. You know, Kraft has a organic food company. Every yeah. major food company has an organic subsidiary, which is making the food in very subtly different ways that really aren't that different. And it's just not healthier. And what drives me crazy is that we know we need Americans, we'd rather them eat more fruits and vegetables. And the idea that we are going to quibble with people as to whether they're eating the right fruits and vegetables, instead of just being celebrating that they're eating any fruits and vegetables, is missing the game entirely. Rule Amen. number five, use salt and fats, including butter and oil, as needed in food preparation. I'm just saying. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're in the pump pumps. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dr. Carroll, you're just phenomenal, and the book is fascinating. Thank you Thank so you. much for being our guest. Thank you. Anytime. Dr. Aaron Carroll, author of The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. We love the local. Please support your local food growers and food makers. For our podcast, you know what to do, foodschmooze.org, and we'll be right back with something special. This is the Food Schmooze Party, offering the richness of life and coming to you in Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York, including Westchester County, the east end of Long Island, the Hamptons, of course. The senior producer is Robin Doyon Aiken, and to hear this show on Connecticut Public, it airs Thursdays at 3 and 9 and Saturdays at noon. You can get the podcast and all of our curated recommendations always online at foodschmooze.org. Gee, I've been waiting for this because this is among the things that I appreciate the most when somebody says to me, I've got a new hot spot oh or even an old hot spot for yes. you in New York. You've got to go to this place and here's why kind of thing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I've known Sarah Newland for quite some time. She's founder and president of the Sherwin B. Newland Foundation for Palliative Care. But she, for our starting point, is really loves food and wine <laughs> and cocktails, as I do. Sarah, you said you'd been eating at a place in New York. One of Shep's and my children, the youngest, works at Del Posto. So Dad, it, yeah. is this a pick based on family loyalty? Not or? at all. In thinking about coming and talking about food, I thought, what is it that stays in your memory in terms of something that you can taste when you just think about it? And my daughter, who works at Del Posto, we went and had lunch together. And one of the things that we had was a soup, a brodo, with squash tortellini. I can, at this second, taste what that broth was like. It was spectacular. We ate endless, beautiful dishes. But this one, I'm salivating. My, my mouth is dr I'm drooling right now. <laughs> And it has, I'm it has, just listening it, to it, you. And it has a tiny bit of black truffle in it, too. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you, so I said to Molly, I need to know about this. So she got me the specs on it. This is a restaurant, fine dining, Italian restaurant, extraordinary. And I know Lydia Bastianich is one of your favorite people. Yeah. This is one of her restaurants and is now run by her daughter and her son. And so I said to Molly, how does this happen? How does a broth like that happen? And she said, Mom, let me tell you. First of all, they'd start with 30 capons in this huge stock pot with water, and they cook it, broth, cook it. And then they add another 30 chickens no. into oh, yeah. it so and more and more. Yeah. And then another 30 yeah, chickens. Triple. It is 90 chickens to this make broth. this broth. It's clear. You could read a newspaper through it. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful 
amber, so it's never boiled. Semi-white. It just simmers perfectly. Yeah. Like a consomme almost. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, yeah. it is unbelievable. And the tortellini are, they're tiny, they're little, yeah. because they're meant to be like, get this, Venus's belly button. Because who was it that looked through? It was someone, Venus and Jupiter came to an inn to sleep, and the innkeeper peered through the keyhole to see what Venus was, and all he saw was her belly button. So he went down to the kitchen, and he made tortellini. Aww, I mean, I didn't know that story. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Del Posto is located... Down in the meatpacking district. It's way over on the west side. I think it's around 14th Street yeah. and 10th or 11th Avenue. Yeah. Sarah, I don't know how to thank you. I'm heading back there so fast. Oh, and you let me know when you want to go, please. And and we're going to have that. Oh, well, this is winter. This is a winter. Will they serve it into spring a little bit? No. Can we call ahead? Can we call call ahead and ask them to do it? No, I think. bring your 90 capons with you. (laughs) Yeah. Can you imagine 90 live capons coming into Del Posto? Can you make the Brodo? It's a New Yorker cartoon. (laughs) So, wow. Yeah. I'm a good eater. So to be able to have an experience like that uh, in a restaurant like that doesn't is, happen every day. Right? No, 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 no. It doesn't. But it is worth a trip. A, it is worth the trip. The whole trip. Yeah. No question. Wow. So love and care and me. You just a save like up. That is oh. worth every bit. It doesn't matter which restaurant you eat in of Lydia. Her love comes through. Mm-hmm. Right. I've eaten in almost every single one of them. So now, talented. And it's just there's something magical happening in her kitchens. I agree. This is fine dining and this mm-hmm. is serious food, but it's serious food done in such a way that it sucks you in. It pulls yeah. you in and you're part yeah. of this wonderful experience. So y'all go. So <laughs> y'all go. Bring a thermos. I, can I have to ask you, Please. Sarah, you were an actress. Mm-hmm. And, and someone whose work I so admired. And you were also married. Your late husband was Sherwin. We knew him as Shep mm-hmm. Newland. Right. Another person I was just crazy about, like you. So then I saw that you started this Sherwin Newland Foundation right. for Palliative Care. Right, right. What is that? Is it different from what hospice does? Palliative care is supportive care that is given while a person is having curative medicine at the same time. Medicine is so siloed that one becomes their disease. And we lose sight of the fact that this is a person that happens to be sick with this disease. And palliative care started in the early 90s. Diane Meyer, Dr. Diane Meyer, who's down at Mount Sinai, started this. It's supportive care. It is taking care of the patient and their caregivers and family and helping relieve stress and suffering that goes along with the major disease. So in a perfect world, when a person is diagnosed with a serious disease, palliative care is there to say, we're here to support you and your family, you and your caregiver, whatever your family is, as you live with this disease. There's social workers and there's chaplaincy. It's a huge team that supports the whole person. The truth of the matter is we live until we die. And so the idea Mm -hmm. that we want to have our lives as recognizable as possible from the minute someone says, you have this disease, any disease at any stage in life. So this is amazing to me because you know how in some practice groups, the idea is that you must be, as they say, quote unquote, exactly six months from leaving this planet. And then you're qualified to receive that care. Hospice, hospice. That's hospice care. Kind of People think that palliative medicine and hospice are synonymous and they are not Think of a chart with palliative care being at the moment of diagnosis, Mm. where your life changes, your identity changes, it switches. Now, again, in a perfect world, we want to switch back and let you be the person that you were before you got this diagnosis. You get palliative care at that moment, the beginning of a disease, and hospice is way, way, way out toward the end of your life, the last stage stage of your living. But palliative care helps you live a life that is recognizable to yourself, who you are. 
part of this came out of my experience with my husband's death and dying. He didn't get palliative care until very near the end of his life, and then it flipped into hospice care. But as I had that experience and Shep died, I thought, no, this isn't the way it should be. We have to be recognizable. Please let each one of us be recognizable until we draw our last breath. And I'm not flying in the face of curative medicine or, oh, of no. the, or of the people that help us fight disease. But one of the amazing things that Shep said about medicine, and I found this, it was a quote of his, and it fell out of a book, literally. A piece of paper fell out of one of his books. And it said, the primary purpose for the art of medicine is not to cure disease or fight death, but to relieve human suffering. Yeah. Mm. That gets us into all sorts of different realms. I mean, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, and that is what palliative care can do. Wow. You've been going around raising money for the foundation to get this really going. What does getting it going mean? Where does it begin? Well, the foundation starts almost six years ago, and we were very fortunate this year to receive a gift to endow a chair in palliative medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And that is transformative in terms of teaching the next generation the importance of palliative care. The name of the chair is the Sherwin B. Newland and Michael K. Vlock Professor of Palliative Medicine. It's so exciting. And the woman who is the chief of the palliative service, Jennifer Capo, She has been named to that. And it means everything. It means that palliative care has traditionally, in a number of medical centers, been about cancer. But we want to look across the whole hospital. So this is reminding me of a man who was on this show. And I looked at him. He's, you know, an internist in Hartford. And I said, what is health to you? Mm. And he said, I would say after seeing people across all walks of life, you know, rich and poor, everything in between, I would say health is the ability to adjust to the circumstances you're in. Mm -hmm. Mm. I don't think he means you get away with that scot-free, but he said the people who have the, the best and least suffering are people who find a way to start to adjust. And I think that's what you're describing. Yeah. And we are given help in that. It's not somebody saying, buck up, but it's someone saying, how are your children? How are your children coping with this? Or how is how's your partner coping with this? When Jennifer Capo, who was the chief of the service at Yale, when she talked to Shep for the first time, and then she said to me and to our children, I want to examine Dr. Newland now. We left the room. One of my children burst into tears when we stepped outside. He said, someone's taking care of my father, which is not to say that Shep wasn't getting good medical care. But all of a sudden, someone was taking care of not a disease, but my father. I mean, Mm. that's profound. That's the difference, right? That is absolutely the difference. And so we are relieving human suffering, and that's what we need to do. This is amazing. I am so glad we got to talk about this. Really. And part of what the foundation is doing, too, we need to change the culture so that people know to ask for it. Yeah. What are we asking for? Palliative care. Does that mean anywhere? Yes. You can say to your doctor, if say you're, you land in a situation, you've got some disease, say, I would like to see someone in palliative medicine. And you get referred by your doc and you get this kind of medicine. It is paid for now by insurance. It's like the missing piece. Right. No matter what hospital, it's not just where the chair is at Yale. No, it's not just where the chair is at Yale. It is at major hospitals throughout the country and even less than major teaching hospitals throughout the country. Wow. Part of what is important is teaching doctors who are specialists in particular areas how to do their own primary palliative care because most people are trained in a particular kind of medicine and that's the riddle you want to solve. And you lose sight of the fact that you have a person attached to that disease. So to get the culture nationally 
for people to understand that they can do early palliative care with their patients, even in their own specialty. Let's say you're a doctor and you think you're not even sure that the person is going to die from this. Mm -hmm. You can still give them palliative care? Oh, sure, sure. Because it has to do with talking about the person and who they are. Because you're part of this extraordinary ecosystem, you need to maintain the ecosystem and help people maintain their own ecosystems so they can be who they are. How hard is palliative care to accept? You've been diagnosed with something. I mean, that's got to be an emotionally difficult thing to even to say you need palliative care. Accepting the fact that you have a serious disease is hard in and of itself, but accepting someone saying, let me help you live your life and live with this disease while you're getting the curative medicine, I think is not as complex as we might anticipate. It's a helping hand. Well, you're just amazing. Thank oh you so God, much for being on the show. Yeah. Adore you. Sarah Newland, who lives in Hamden, Connecticut, is president and founder of the Sherwin B. Newland Foundation for Palliative Care. You can find out more about anything we talked about here online at Newland, N-U-L-A-N-D, newlandfoundation.org. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. What fun and what a good time we're having. We're on Connecticut Public Radio Thursdays at 3 and 9 and Saturdays at noon. Weekdays, you can listen for my 60-second food schmoozes and never eat more than you can lift. In New Haven, I'm Faith Middleton. Everybody eats when they come to my Hey, don't want the party to end? Well, neither do we. Talk with us anytime online at foodschmooze.org.